Thank you, Christian. And I think the doors are closing. And um, I, I really want to welcome you to this uh, uh, global networking forum uh, on the carbon footprint of monitoring climate change from space, also from the industry and agency level. Um, I think it's, we have discussed a lot uh, during uh, yesterday and this morning. We had plenary lectures, we had uh, highlight lectures, we had uh, uh, forums, and we had technical sessions. And uh, it is clear how important, of course, all the, um, uh, uh, the satellites are and the measurements we take uh, for our future to combat uh, climate change and go into the future. But Monitoring uh, uh, climate change from space also involves a carbon footprint, primarily due to manufacturing, uh, due to testing, to launching satellites, and all these um, activities, they require energy, uh, they often uh, require carbon-based sources, which contribute again uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. So um, we also know the space sector is booming. We have uh, a large number of satellites uh, and launches. Everything increases extremely rapidly. And uh, what we want to discuss today, and I think that's a really great continuation to all the panels and all the, uh, the uh, new scientific knowledge and, and policies which we discussed in the last days, we want to discuss the impact of this carbon footprint of various space activities and also review the concerns, uh, but also look what's already done. What are the measures which are already done uh, by the industry by, on the agency level um, and see uh, what is there to do and how complex is the whole system. So um, this forum is also an opportunity to highlight the recent uh, signature of the joint statement for a responsible space sector under the leadership of the European Space Agency. And um, this session, uh, as has been discussed, is um, organized by Ariane Group. And I would like now to introduce my uh, really distinguished panel members. Uh, and number one is Aurélie Galis from the European Space Agency. She is the Climate and Sustainability Officer. And then uh, I want to welcome Thomas Marceau. He's the head of sustainability and corporate support at Air Ariane Group. <laughs> Cedric Bolti, Director Innovation and Chief Sustainability Officer, Thales Alenia Space. <laughs> then we have uh, Mathieu Deray, De a Space Product Sustainability Manager from Airbus Defense and Space. And Sabrina Alam, Head of Space Sustainability and ESG Program Manager from SES. <laughs> so I, I think uh, something which is um, uh, I think quite wonderful is that you see that measures are already taken because all of my panel members they do have a title, uh, namely sustainability officer or head of sustainability support. So there are, there are already activities going in this direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a really, really good sign. What, what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, with some opening statements. And um, uh, you also know you can ask questions uh, through the Slido system. They will end up here. And um, so we, um, we will start with some kind of uh, opening remarks. We have also some supporting slides, which will be called uh, for, from, from, <laughs> from time to time, because it's a quite a complex problem, and we, have, uh, we really need uh, sometimes the overview over the entire ecosystem of those activities. And uh, so I, I, um, I hope that you will be active and answer and asking uh, us questions because I think it will be really, really an interesting session. And I'm going to start uh, at the beginning uh, to ask some uh, questions for an opening statement. And uh, mm -hmm. I would like to ask Aurélie Galis. Uh, so what are ESA's actions towards decarbonization and um, of, of uh, all the different activities? Thank you, um, Pascal. And indeed, uh, at ESA, we have 
important target that we set up in the ESA Agenda 2025 uh, towards decarbonization of, of space uh, activities. So ESA strives for being a role model uh, as a global and a modern space agency. And for this, we have two main targets. One is the, what we call the end print, so increasing our end print, so the contribution we, of the project to sustainable development of society. So it is traduced into the agenda, agenda 2025, into the way that ESA ensured that uh, ESA and uh, European uh, space program can support the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the European Green Deal uh, to the fullest extent. On the other side, we, have, uh, we are working on our footprint, so ensuring that we decrease effectively our, our footprint, um, ensuring the socially and environmentally responsible management of our activity, and we have the, the goal of decarbonize, decarbonize our activity um, of 46% uh, at the horizon uh, 2030, um, with regard to the baseline of 2019, so for what we call the, the scope one and two of our carbon footprint. So really, we really work on, on, on this bust target, so having a, the improvement of our imprint and the, the decrease of our footprint. Um, and for this, uh, and in order to, to turn our decarbonization targets into action and address the sustainability objective of the Agenda 2025, we have set up the, what we call the ESA Green Agenda, which is um, organized into five main axes uh, and with the goal to, to reach the 2030 targets. So these five main axes are, the first one is to adopt sustainability objective for ESA project to increase the benefits of, uh, the, of the benefits of the programs. So again, the end print. The second, um, Axis is to reduce the uh, environmental footprint of ESA assets, so including the technical and non-technical facilities. The third one is to reduce the environmental impact of our programs and of the life cycle of the space system. So we really deal here with life cycle assessment and eco-design um, for the, the conception to the exploitation and of the of the of the space um, of the space system. And of course we work in close collaboration with the space industry. The fourth uh, axis is to enforce the ESA responsible uh, procurement by engaging our suppliers uh, along the ESA corporate responsibility uh, principle. And for this, we have developed a code of conduct uh, for, the, for the suppliers. And the fifth target is to promote cultural change, so bring awareness, um, having a developing a structured change management approach. So that's the main axis we are working in. And um, as a conclusion, we are working on all perimeters. So again, this question of reducing our footprint, improving our, our handprint, but also um, working in collaboration with all the supply chain and the space industry. Well, thank you, Aurélie. This is um, actually quite a complex framework, and there are many, many different parameters. And I think we will get uh, into detail of some of them, also, also, also with the other speakers. Uh, Thomas, um, you actually suggested uh, the idea yeah. <laughs> for this panel. So what are the stakes uh, for our, our young group? Well, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, the IAF for allowing this panel to take place uh, because we've been uh, hearing a lot about all the advantages that space uh, can bring in order to fight against climate change, in order to monitor all the parameters of, of the planet, the temperature, the, the, the ice, the sea levels and so on, which are entirely uh, important, crucial for the, the fight against climate change, and we are definitely in support of that. And that's, uh, I mean, that's our purpose in Iron Group, to make uh, space available for the benefits of all mankind, for all citizens in a safe world. That's our motto. And so we, we definitely support that. But that shouldn't uh, prevent us from taking care about our own impact. Because uh, when we talk about space uh, in the public society, they don't think about the satellites that uh, help them uh, navigate through the cities. They don't think about the satellite that helps them uh, uh, communicating with cell phones. They don't think about the, all the applications that satellites bring in order to, uh, to help with climate change. They think about the impact. 
And I've heard a very interesting, actually a very interesting roundtable yesterday uh, right here about communication uh, relating to space activities and, and the questions uh, are really about our impact. When I go to schools, when I go to an university talking about what we do and all the benefits that, bri that we bring, the first question I get is, okay, but what is your impact? And this is definitely something we need to address uh, because otherwise, if we don't address that question, then all the benefits that we can bring, we'll lose them. So definitely, we, we need to focus on our own impact, and that's, uh, I heard yesterday uh, someone uh, saying we need to walk the talk. And yes, we definitely need to, to walk the talk. And uh, space, uh, for decades, was, I would say, an institutional uh, business. It was driven by agencies, by governments, by institutional actors, but now there are plenty of newcomers. Uh, I've read on my way going to this conference that there are currently 160 uh, new uh, projects of launchers uh, being developed all around the world, 160. And all these launchers, they will not uh, launch only uh, Earth observation satellites, and believe me, you know, they are not here to uh, all to uh, monitor the planet. So we need to focus as well on the impact of, of the global space sector in order to be sure that this tool, the, the, the space tool, the, re the resources that we get from space for space inno innovation, space observation, are sustainable as well. So that's why uh, we wanted to, uh, to propose this round table to, to show that we need as well to take care of, of our own impact. That's what we started in Argan Group as well. We, we, are, we are working with ESA, um, Aurélie mentioned that. Uh, we are conducting what we call life cycle analysis to, to, uh, to analyze uh, what uh, are the impact of each and every step of the production process from the cradle to the grave, from the first element of, of, the, of the rocket launcher uh, until the end of uh, the mission, the dismantling, and we need to to collectively, I think it's the whole point of this round table, to collectively as a sector address this question, to have common tools, common methodologies in order to, to address the, this impact. That was the, the whole point of my uh, proposal for this round table. It's a large topic and uh, we will not uh, be able to go into every detailed aspect, but uh, we, get our, uh, we got already quite some interesting questions from the audience so very much in the first minute. Yeah. So Cedric, um, what is uh, Thales Alenia's uh, perception of sustainability uh, for the space sector and uh, what kind of methods do you have to address it? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, first, I, I would like to echo to, uh, the comment of uh, Thomas and Aurélie. I think uh, definitely if we are here, we are already collaborating on various aspects. It's uh, really uh, an ecosystemic approach. And if we are uh, uh, providing solutions to try to help and solve uh, issue on issues on the planet, we also need to take care about our own impact, as uh, Thomas said. And uh, maybe something important to remind, it's, it's, it could be carbon, but in our industry it could be different things than carbon. So carbon is, is not the only topic we need to tackle. So we all have this type of 50% uh, uh, decrease of carbon footprint in, uh, for, for us, at least in 2030. And, and, uh, but it's more or less the same type of uh, objectives that we have uh, from one company to another. But we need also to take care about other potential impacts on biodiversity. On, we know that the launchers could have other type of impact. We don't really know what is the impact of a satellite, which is burning in the atmosphere. So these are things we need to tackle. We also need to tackle the outer space. So we are sending things up there. Uh, what happens is they stay up there, and how do we manage the debris? So this is also about uh, sustainability. Uh, in Thales Alina Space, we are uh, really starting a journey since uh, a bit more than a year now, and tackling it quite uh, holistically and globally. Uh, there is a very, uh, let's say, first important step is how can we engage our teams, our people. And uh, just when we created this, uh, this directorate uh, about around sustainability, there has been spontaneously many people coming to us. So we want to engage our employees. Uh, we want to train and bring awareness to them, and we want to leverage all this energy for the company to be able to, to, to tackle these challenges. So that's one of our uh, strong uh, uh, strategic axes. Uh, definitely, we want to tackle sustainability and go as far as possible into circularity uh, when it makes sense. Uh, and we want also to see how, can, how space could contribute um, in a wider way to the, the global challenges of our planet. So it's a quite holistic approach and uh, the starting point of a quite long journey probably. 
Um, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Cedric. Uh, um, I think after the, the, the opening round, we will probably show those slides, mm -hmm. and you can all speak a little bit to it that the people mm -hmm. understand how complex actually the topic is. Mm -hmm. So I'm, 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 I would like now to ask uh, Mathieu. Um, uh, you are from Airbus uh, Defence and Space, so what does sustainability mean uh, uh, for, for ADS, and, and what are the stakes for the space sector? Um, so thanks uh, for having me first uh, here uh, around this round table. Um, it's uh, very important for me to, to talk about uh, the footprint, yes. Uh, so far uh, in this event, we've been again talking about uh, a lot about the handprint, uh, which is, uh, yes, what uh, space is bringing to humanity with uh, Earth observation, connectivity, uh, science, um, but very little about the footprint. So. Very good. Uh, this is what we mean by footprint is, uh, if I make it simple, not too complex, uh, this is about the resources that we take for, our, for creating our product and the waste we are producing, simply. So what that stakes for us in the space sector, indeed, uh, is, is to, um, for, in, for example, uh, when you take the finance sector uh, and you need some funding for your investment, you go and ask for, uh, for money. Mm -hmm. for you build your business case, and you ask for, uh, you explain what will be the future revenues. But of course, it wouldn't work. Uh, you wouldn't be credible if you don't ask, you don't expose also what, what are your costs. Mm -hmm. So to be credible, we need to do the same here. Mm -hmm. Talk about what we bring, and also what it costs for the environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, um, in Airbus, Sustainability is uh, at the core of our uh, purpose, so, uh, which is uh, um, we pioneer sustainable aerospace for the safe and united world. We have four pillars. Uh, the first is lead the journey toward the cleaner aerospace. The second, uh, respect human rights and foster inclusion. Third, build our business on the foundation of safety and quality. And the fourth about uh, business integrity. And of course, today we are here to talk mainly about cleaner uh, space activities and our journey within this. And as a space manufacturer, which is uh, our, my responsibility, our responsibility as a company, uh, we have a few hotspots, uh, and we will come back to, to them on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, first of them is mainly about scope one and two, meaning, uh, yeah, maybe we can show the, the slide directly. Um, so this is from the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, this is a framework not, not for space, this is for all the, the sectors, huh? uh, where uh, you see the uh, scope one direct emission from the companies for their uh, operations in their facilities and the company vehicles. The second is the is a first in indirect, but very much related to the activities of the sites, with the uh, purchase electricity and uh, steam heating and so on. And the scope three is quite vast, with a lot of upstream activities. Mainly for us, we are talking about purchase of goods and products. Uh, products. And, uh, and the downstream uh, part of the scope three, uh, we have a lot uh, in the use of sole products. And you see some other activities. And here are the, the hotspots, yes, for, for us. Uh, scope one and two, yes, the buildings the, for the operation of uh, test, test facilities, IIT rooms, uh, also the tertiary buildings for, for all the engineers. This is a, a hot topic. Also, we have the commuting and business trips. Today, we have a footprint uh, with this event. I don't know what is the computation in the end, but uh, there, there's been probably a lot of travels. Uh, and the a thir third one is, uh, is related also, and that's something that we are doing together with uh, ESA and the other actors, is looking at the product's footprint uh, with a scope three purchase upstream and uh, utilization downstream um, that probably Sabrina will talk about. 
Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, thank you very much, Mathieu. This is, uh, I think, uh, quite important and informative for, um, you know, uh, people here in the audience which are, you know, coming from a different field and uh, want to see uh, the whole picture. It's not so easy. And I think uh, a lot of people are also not familiar with what is scopes one and two and three. So I think uh, it's important also to bring that much more into the discussion and uh, with, with public relations material so that people really understand this complicated cycle and that actually industry and agency level, organization level are already really working on that. Um, uh, so Sabrina, I'm, I'm coming to you. Uh, what does sustainability uh, mean to SES and also the wider industry? Sure, well thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today as well and thank you for the invitation uh, to SES. So one thing I want to address is that I think there's a common myth that tackling sustainability or climate change is easy. You know, we hear a lot about just do it. Uh, why don't you measure your emissions? Oh, you need to reduce your emissions. And whilst that's 100 percent true, it's not simple. You know, it is a journey. And, and we saw uh, on the slides there are scopes one, there's scopes two, there's scope three. But it actually goes way beyond that. And when we talk about sustainability in general, we're talking about you know, everything from the environmental side. So as Cedric mentioned, biodiversity, uh, eutrophication, ozone depletion, so on. We're also talking about the social aspect. Mm -hmm. How can we expect to solve climate change and solve the climate crisis without thinking about the people around the world that also contribute to it or are going to be suffering from it? Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that we need to address. And then on the governance side, and I'm talking from a very ESG uh, perspective here, but we need to think about what countries have different rules in place. What are the regulations? What are the trends at the moment? When we talk about sustainability, it has to link with business objectives. There's no point just saying we're going to do something completely different because your company won't adopt it in the right way otherwise. It needs to make sense for your company. And so when we look at sustainability at SES, we look at it within four pillars. The first being space sustainability. Of course, we're a satellite operator. We have a duty uh, in space that we need to tackle. We look at climate action, and so that's looking at how we achieve our net zero roadmap. How do we actually go beyond just saying we're going to be net zero by this time, but actually doing it in an accurate way. And so actually, we've all had discussions here because we've reached out to create partnerships on uh, life cycle assessments, which should accurately tell us what our footprint is and how we can reduce it. And it goes beyond that where we have a concept called eco-design. How do we then use the information that we've gathered to actually reduce our emissions and do better, innovate better, design better? Um, and then uh, on the other side of it, it's also working with the industry, being at these kind of events, talking about it, making sure that within our contracts, when we talk to suppliers and vendors, we're telling them, what are you doing to reduce your emissions? What are you doing for the planet? Do you even have a strategy? And at some point, what we want to do is be able to actually create this kind of rating where we say, you're not looking at sustainability properly so we're actually not going to select you. And so it goes beyond this kind of finance risk uh, metric. It goes into that third category where we talk about impact. And so at SCS, that's what we're doing. That's the journey that we're currently on. And I can tell you now, it's not easy. You know, It's not something that we, we woke up one day and said, let's do this, and it was done. <laughs> mm. um, it's something we're still in the process of. We're still creating those partnerships. We're, you know, we have these roadmaps. Um, and, you know, it's partners like you all, it's partners like everyone who's here that's going to help us achieve it. Um, and on the other side, and, you know, as a corporation, maybe I shouldn't say this, but actually it's consumers. Consumers have such high power that you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Our customers had to ask us, what are you doing from a climate perspective? We want your data. That's a huge incentive for your company, your senior leaders, to actually say, OK, I need to think about this because it's going to directly impact my business and the model that I have going forward. And so we have loads of different drivers from all areas. So sustainability, in a nutshell, really means making sure our business, our operations, are having a positive impact on the planet, on people, and we reduce um, the negative impact from all dimensions. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sabrina, and I think uh, 
I showed also the different categories and also the interest for, for the industry to move into this topic. Um, I, I have a combination of questions, and please uh, let um, uh, the staff know if we should show the, the, the second slide or the first slide again, because of the complexity of the topic. Um, I want to actually to combine one of uh, the first question of our, our, our audience with something what we anyway wanted to discuss. Uh, we need a regulation on how carbon equal footprint is calculated by the space sector to have comparable figures. Mm -hmm. How is this organized? And we actually wanted also certainly to tackle what is the major uh, or what are the no uh, knowledge gaps, you know, uh, uh, related to the space sector footprint. Uh, and maybe I start with you, Aurelia, and whoever wants to continue. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, in terms of regulation of eco-design, or at least guidelines that we can all have together uh, within the space sector. At ESA, we have the Clean Space Initiative, which is leading the life cycle assessment and eco-design uh, uh, expertise since uh, 2010. And for this, they have been uh, working on guidelines for the space sector, well, building the framework actually for the space sector. So uh, providing guidelines on how to do life cycle assessment for the space sector if uh, a, a company or uh, an academia or a um, uh, uh, space agency want to run a life cycle assessment. So what is the basis of eco-design, life cycle assessment, etc. Which kind of environmental indicator we have to look at, for example. And they, are also, they have also been working, and they are, there is a work on going to update this, the, life cycle, uh, the space life cycle database. So the space sector, in terms of um, to, for doing a life cycle assessment in the space sector, you need to have a specific data sets because materials are specific for the space sector. Some processes are specific. Um, so the data sets that we provide are very useful in that sense. And on the, of course, we know that we have gap analysis, a gap, some gaps in, this, uh, in, in data sets. Uh, and we were mentioning at the beginning that, for example, atmospheric impact is something that for today we don't have. So it's, we are working on the update and improvement of all the the framework, I would say, to help really the, the space sector working correctly uh, in eco-design and life cycle assessment. And maybe we can put the second slide, I think, so we, we can <coughs> explain what is really eco-design. Well, eco-design, it's, it's an holistic approach, and <coughs> when it's, we speak about life cycle assessment, it's uh, basically the most powerful uh, methodology we have, a scientific methodology to evaluate the environmental impact through the life cycle of, uh, of a project. So really, uh, going from the extraction of resource to the end of life of, uh, of the project. So it's an iterative, the eco-design is an iterative approach, so that's why we need um, data to do life cycle assessment. We need, we need uh, to do also hypothesis, because we, if we want to do an eco-design process from the, really the beginning of a program, we have to rely on hypothesis and data set. But the, the, really, the core of eco-design is to improve the environmental performance of a, of a, product, uh, or a project without reducing the, the final quality or performance of it. Um, and if I can maybe final uh, end with um, uh, eco-design guidelines and directive uh, at European uh, level there is also the eco-design regulation mm -hmm. uh, and um, a, an objective to have common uh, way of doing also life cycle assessment uh, uh, which is called PEF, the product environmental uh, uh, footprint rules. Mm. And maybe to, to comment on the question of the, of the gaps you, you mentioned, to be very, very short about that. But uh, when we talked about the uh, various scopes, scopes one, scope two, scope three, uh, scope one and two are mainly about what you do uh, on your site, uh, the energy you consume, the, the, the greenhouse gases that you, that you emit. But that's on your site. That's uh, within your premises, mm -hmm. so to speak. So that's something you, you actually kind of map quite easily. It's not perfect, <coughs> but you, you map it quite easily. But what happens? upstream and what happens downstream, it's a whole new territory. And depending on the, what, you, what we call the emission factor you use, 
For example, if I buy one kilogram of uh, X ma this material, or if I buy one kilo euro of this uh, application or whatever, you can have uh, factors from 10 to, s to 100 to 1,000, uh, depending on the emission factor you use. And we also have uh, huge uncertainties about the use of our products. For example, we, uh, for space, uh, space uh, launchers, uh, we don't know exactly what happens during the launch phase. We know quite well what happens on the ground, but when the launcher lifts off and it goes through the various layers of the atmosphere, it emits uh, uh, various uh, uh, byproducts of the, con of, the um, of the propellants, and we don't know exactly the effects of these products. So. It's a brand new territory, uh, and it's uh, very complex to map uh, what happens behind and after uh, what happens in-house. So we definitely need some common, uh, common rules, common methodologies, common referential to, to say, OK, if I buy one kilogram of this, that's one, uh, one uh, kilogram of CO2 or whatever. And I'd just like to yeah. further compliment. So one of the reasons why I love this panel is because you have your manufacturers, your launchers, you have ESA who kind of looks over the European uh, space domain, and then you have the satellite operator. So hi. And um, what we're <laughs> and one of the things that we're doing for life cycle assessments is connecting with each of you because um, we can't do this alone. SES, for example, we you know purchase our um, satellites from the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. We then say to the launchers, oh, you know, we've got two major ones. Hey, can you uh, launch our satellite into space? Um, and then when it's in space, you know, it's floating around. We've, we've got our uh, operations team. But actually, every, and we also have our ground infrastructure as well. And there's so many different pieces mm -hmm. to it. And every single one of them contributes to what we call the scope three, mm -hmm. which makes up 90% of SES's emissions. Mm -hmm. And that 90% is so, I would say, the data is very unreliable because we mm. don't have this concrete data. So how do we get it? We come to you know, our value chain and we say, hey, um, we really need this data. Uh, could you help us? Let's conduct these life cycle assessments together. Now, the issue is when you go into legal confide confidentiality um, problems, that's when it becomes a whole different domain. How are we able to share raw data? How are we able to still remain within competition rights? How are we uh, still able to remain, I would say, legal in terms of what data we can share? Um, and there's so many different complexities around that for us to say, let's address climate change properly. Let's get accurate data. Now we know exactly what the value chain is doing. We can say, all right, this is what our real, you know, these are what our emissions are. And I don't just mean carbon dioxide, because I think that's another myth that carbon dioxide is the only contributing um, emission to climate change. I'm talking about the whole set of GHG emissions as well. So it's about, you know, finding a way to navigate these issues and these challenges. And, and the way we've done it is through connecting with, uh, with partners and asking them to do a section of this, uh, the constellation, us to do a section, um, the ground infrastructure people to do, this, uh, to do a section, and so on. But then you've got to think about the way that space and our industry is so global. Why is it that you know, the US have different rules to EU and so on? So where EU-based companies are almost going to be obliged to do this work because of new regulations coming up, like the CSRD, um, you know, US players don't have to. So what's the incentive for them yeah. to then work with us to give that information? So that's just the perspective I, I wanted to, to share there. Mm. I think yeah. you uh, Yeah, to complement on that, on the international aspects, uh, there is also the fact that um, we, there is the methodology also on the way to account these, uh, these things. Of course, COP1 and 2 and 3 are, are general to all sectors, as I said, but we have some specificities in, in, in the sector with, uh, for instance, the aluminum that we use is not the same. The propellant are different from, from other sectors. So we need to compute those data. We need to share those data and we need to have common methodologies for that. And that's why we are working with the International uh, Aerospace uh, Environment Group, the AIAG, to start looking on, on those methodologies and way to compute the data based on the aerospace, which is a bit more advanced on, on those topics and because it's a bigger sector as well. 
Seth, also before we, um, because uh, I think the, the, the uh, audience is a bit overloaded with all the different <laughs> unknowns and gaps and things, it's a new topic. We have to orientate ourselves, we have to build it. Uh, sustainable, uh, sustainability offers are more or less a new category in many uh, uh, companies. Uh, I would like still to hear your. your um, idea about gaps and, and what is important before we go a little bit more into the topic, how can we solve all that? <laughs> how can we? How, how can we solve it? Later oh. on, I think we have to discuss really what kind of regulations, what targets and so on. But um, concerning in particular the knowledge gaps and mm. Do you still uh, have uh, uh, something yeah, to add? Yeah, I think, again, it's a journey, and I, I would just mm -hmm. uh, echo to what has been yeah. said. I mean, uh, Scope 3 is clearly an issue for all of us. Very interestingly, we are all working together somehow on these topics because we are all, uh, or most of all, uh, Scope 3 of the other. Uh, so there's a huge uncertainty. Uh, there are gaps, yes. I would say, a little bit everywhere. Yeah. Uh, there are probably also new uh, roles to play in the companies, mm -hmm. new types of... Uh, of uh, actors that we need to identify, to create, to position in the right areas. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like quality was something new uh, 30 years ago, something like that. Uh, I think sustainability is something new also in our company. So there is a, a gap in terms of knowledge and how we, we tackle the, the topics. I think that's also fundamental. It was a very important point uh, put on the table by uh, Sabrina, is that we are in Europe, I think uh, all of us individually are very much concerned and we all collaborate. And then there is this, this regulation which is coming, which is helping us. But it's very important to keep in mind that we need to remain competitive with regard to our competitors which are not in Europe. Mm. And that's a fundamental issue also for us as an industrial company. So we are convinced and we are working to change mm -hmm our ecosystem, our industry, mm -hmm. but we need also to take care about how our competitors are moving in this direction because sometimes it may have some impact on our costs. Uh, sometimes it can have virtuous levers, so it's not always negative in terms of uh, competitiveness, but it's really a key point of attention. So, um, yeah, I think a very important point to keep in mind, people have to change in the company, in their jobs, in their mindset. And we also need to be very cautious about uh, our capability to continue and grow our business and not to be kicked away of our, our, our core uh, business. Sure. Um, thank you very much. We have quite a, 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 a lot of questions and I will try to fit them in, but I wanted to ask one thing because uh, to, to Thomas, because you said there are, I have written down 160 different launcher projects mm -hmm. yeah, over, uh, over worldwide. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow it, you have to understand, you know, what is the, the, the global impact or so of all that. Mm -hmm. So how is the international cooperation and, and how, how do we uh, actually work together in order to get more knowledge. You said that many of the parameters uh, during a launch are not enough measured. You know uh, very, uh, very much what's going on on the ground at launch, but not uh, in the atmospheric. There's a lot of research which is necessary for the mm. future. So um, when, when you say there are so many launcher projects, is there a basis, a platform of discussion about those parameters and how you can, uh, how do you say, um, uh, engage in data sharing? Well, uh, apart from the platform, which are driven by, by, uh, by ESA directly, uh, not much that I know of. Now, some start research are starting on, on the topic because it's always a complex problem with various parameters. It depends on the type of propellant you use. It, it depends on the, on the launcher itself. It depends on the fact which is a reusable launcher or an expendable launcher. So it depends on plenty of parameters, the size of the launcher, and so on and so on. So. Um, it's definitely a knowledge gap today. <laughs> there are some early research about the topic, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes uh, some of them uh, telling uh, the contrary of the other. Mm -hmm. I've read in one serious article telling that uh, uh, we emit alumina when we use a solid propulsion, telling that it could actually cool down the planet mm -hmm. because it reflects <laughs> some uh, energy coming uh, from the sun uh, into space. And I, I've read in another article that actually it's uh, an ex uh, uh, global warmer. So. Definitely there is a knowledge gap, and there is a huge knowledge gap on, on, on this topic. So today there is no, to my knowledge, no uh, 
commonly uh, shared uh, database on, on this impact, mm -hmm. and that's definitely something we, we need to work on. So we are working on that with, with ESA, of course, uh, with all the Clean Space Initiative, with all the database which are uh, being set up uh, with, uh, with, with ESA, but uh, not, not at a worldwide level, definitely not. Uh, uh, thanks very much. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to audience questions, um, also from uh, John Reed. Are there standards, ideas for relative cost-benefit evaluation or merit of information sources? Um, and um, for instance, electronic interaction is less effective than in person. <laughs> is there anybody who wants to take this question? Um. Uh, I'll take it as a yeah. reaction. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I can I can answer directly to this question. I think something very important uh, so uh, is the the fact to tackle the topics globally and uh, to educate the people to understand what is at stake. Because you could have a standard which is locally, uh, let's say, on an equipment or on a subsystem, which makes a lot of sense, but it may disoptimize the system. So globally, your system may be generating more impact. And that's a very complex issue. I think it's uh, just an illustration to show that, of course, that's a good, very good question and we need to see how we can answer to it. Mm -hmm. But after we need to be careful when we put it in place that when we are optimizing something locally, mm -hmm. we're not generating a bigger impact because we need to improve or to, to uh, change the way the rest works mm -hmm. to cope with this evolution. So it's a really uh, complex and uh, global topic. So after directly, I don't have any specific answer to this okay. question. But uh, so um, and uh, as I said, uh, the question is very typical. It has been a lot of talk about the complexities, and it's we have seen that on the slides. Uh, even the life cycle analysis is already a really difficult topic. So. Complexities in data and calculation, but it is not fairly clear what is needed to bring down the value chain emissions. I can take that one. Sure. Um, so what I would say, the first step is to look internally. There's no point already reaching out to your value chain if you haven't figured out what your priorities are in your company. So first step, look internally, develop a strategy that you're going to use to tackle sustainability as a whole. That way, your company, yourself, you know exactly where you want to be, what you want to achieve, and who needs to be part of that journey. Um, the second step is also internally, figure out what every department needs to do. Link it to your business objectives. Link it to the senior leadership team remuneration. You know, make sure it's applicable that everyone in your company wants to achieve um, this you know, properly. Once you do that, then you can reach out to your value chain. Then you actually start implementing it in your contracts. You start having these talks. When you have your vendor negotiations, why is sustainability not a huge factor in there? Um, and so implementing that phase at the very beginning before you start developing, uh, you know, your, or even in the design phase, I would say, but before you even start doing that, Figure out what you want your vendors to achieve, what you want your partners to do. Once you have that, you'll see everyone starts working a bit differently. So next contract, all of a sudden, now they're going to start looking at, oh, OK, wait, we need to measure this, we need to measure this. And they're going to start having those data sets in the procurement process too. It's also, and, and one thing I've noticed, it's also starting to become, um, uh, I would say, a negotiation tactic on the other side that, hey, we do sustainability, you know, come to us, um, which is actually great. That's exactly what we need to do. But there needs to be numbers behind that, too. What are you doing as a company or as a manufacturer, as a launcher to develop those data sets? What you, how are you going to share them with us in your design when you do that? How are you going to measure that and keep us informed along the way and vice versa? Um, so uh, to me, and I know that everyone else has maybe, you know, things to add, but it's really look internally, make it applicable to your company, externally incorporate it into every business discussion that you have externally as well, and hold people accountable um, to the work that they say they're going to do, to the targets that they set, um, and also yourself, hold yourself accountable, know where you want to go, know what you need to do, um, mm. and it goes back to the comment, you know, it's not just about talking the talk, it's also, you know, walk the walk, and it's... Uh, it's going to take time, investment, and resource, and that's what I'm saying, you know, for private sector especially, you need your senior leadership teams on board because they need to give you that investment. They need to give you those resources to be able to really tackle this head on. 
-hmm. Yeah, to complement that, yes, walk the walk, and and uh, I, I would say with my words that do your homework, do our homework. That's what we are trying trying to do. Uh, in Airbus, we are disclosing the scope one and two because it's mandatory by regulation. But we go beyond regulation. We try. Uh, as much as we can with a scope three uh, USP, but there are also uh, ways to uh, involve the, the value chain with, uh, as I said, maybe in involving other labels, uh, other standards like a carbon disclosure protocol. We are uh, also trying to work with SBTI, uh, Science Based Target Initiative, to see how, how all this can, uh, can work. That's what we, we in Airbus have been uh, granted or we've been approved uh, recently with this at a, at a group level. Uh, but w for sure, um, what we want to do, as we are, let's say, the, the major uh, actors in Europe uh, for, for space sector, is to go together and influence also regulations, uh, labels, and adapt those, those labels to our, to our sectors. For instance, with the debris management or life uh, sat satellite life extension, mm -hmm. or even uh, with the EU taxonomy. Uh, which is not uh, completely designed for us, but that, uh, that deserves uh, to, uh, to be applicable to us as well. Mm. We, we are quite flexible. We also <laughs> have questions directly from the audience without Slido. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> Klaus Peter Wisch. Thank you. Um, does any one of you take into account the needs of um, all day business later in the companies um, having uh, interfaces to accounting uh, and steering systems like SAP or, 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 or others? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Sorry, mm. you mean take into account what you need to collect the data, or no, t um, to to bring it into the figures of the company. Yes, and so there's there are systems like SAP or others who yeah. manage the whole process of of the companies uh, for all other figure needs. Mm -hmm. So this must be implemented there, otherwise you won't get it through. Mm. Yeah, so 100% we do, and it's also quite a time-consuming task because there mm. are so many solutions out there as well. And it's also about what fits best for you, your organization, how do you then translate it? How is it a manual task then at some point? You know, it, it's quite a few factors that are, need to be considered in, in that kind of decision and what you should take. But the software aspect of it, which I believe you're referring to, is a huge part of uh, you know, achieving your sustainability uh, agenda. And if I can complement also the systems such as SAP, of course they are very powerful in doing life cycle assessment and eco-design because it's basically where you can find the information also mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do this kind of studies. So it's uh, definitely uh, support. Yeah. For instance, uh, what we have in the non-financial reporting for the, the case of Airbus, it's extracted and correlated with the financial systems. All the figures, of course, they are non-quantitative information also, but uh, it's extracted and it's co correlated. But still, there's a lot of work to adapt it to our uh, operations, our own business. Mm. There's one more question from the audience. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question because you talked about the procurement uh, and the supply chain monitoring. Um, so we talk about raw materials and uh, lots of rare earth metals used in the space industry mm -hmm. coming from poor and developing nations in the global south. Mm -hmm. So there is not only the f carbon footprint of mm -hmm. shipping, but also the human cost when it comes to mining, uh, uh, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if, you, if you have um, insights on clauses for extended contractor uh, responsibility, especially if it goes for subcontracting layers, mm. which would be very hard to trace. Uh, my other uh, very short question regarding the applications uh, from the space industry that could help um, the world face the uh, climate change issue and emission reductions, because the space industry is very high in tech, but lots of the tech is patented or either subject to certain regulations because of security and defense, especially when it comes to material sciences. Uh, material sciences, advancements that could actually help us uh, with transport uh, more efficiently, with energy uh, uh, reduction and, and rationalization. So could there be regulations on how the space industry could pass on and transfer their technologies for climate change impact? Thank you. 
Okay, well, we need short answers well, uh, to... Maybe to make it very short, regarding the yeah. question of the raw materials and, and their local impact, that's something we, we, we tackle. I mean, we, we monitor our supply chain and we are strictly regulated by laws in Europe regarding our supply chain, how, how we monitor the supply chain and make sure that the, money, the supply chain is not uh, breaking the law in terms of uh, human trafficking or blood diamonds or, or whatever. It's, it's really part of our ESG process. So definitely that's something we, we, we tackle. One thing I wanted to add, there's actually an EU directive that's about to be announced, which is called the Due Diligence Directive, right. which actually ensures exactly that because, yeah. um, and every company who falls within scope has to oblige, which yeah. means all of us here. Uh, and it's about looking down your supply chain, not just tier one, but all the way at yeah. the bottom to ensure that these practices don't happen. <laughs> So we come, uh, time flies, uh, we come to the uh, final question where you probably, uh, some of you, uh, all of you could answer very fast and I think it's an important question. What can governments do to help? <laughs> uh, uh, must not be everybody, but uh, um, I think it's in such a complex scheme, I think uh, it is a qu it's, a, it's a good question. <laughs> Well, You're regulation right. for sure, and uh, well, if we speak about public, at least at ESA, we are having this statement of a responsible space sector, which is engaging and mobilizing. So the idea is to have our um, contributor uh, signatories on the same level of understanding, awareness, and pushing for mm. awareness. And uh, yeah, mm. but I would say three things. Firstly, include SME startups within. Um, I don't want to say regulations, but they also account for uh, large corporations' value chains as well. So it's important they they give an aid, uh, incentivize. So um, you know, actually create some sort of incentive for large organisations, all types of organisations, to adopt sustainability, track their data, whether they you know provide financial support. Um, and third one is training and community support too. They need to be able to train people up on exactly what sustainability means, how they can tackle it, how they create a strategy, how they work with industry, um, and then also provide that platform. And I think ESA are doing a fantastic job uh, at the moment to bring the sector together to get these discussions flowing and share best practice and challenges. Yeah, to, to balance on what Sabrina is saying, well, what could uh, governments do? I will definitely not say more regulations because we have plenty, uh, we have plenty of regulations in Europe and we are way ahead, uh, I would say, of many countries in, in, that, in that field. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a competitive advantage in a sense in terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So definitely not more regulations, but uh, more awareness, more training about this, uh, this issue, this impact, and also maybe more, more help, more incentives regarding uh, companies which are going in the right direction uh, regarding these topics. Yeah, to, Very short to complement, yes, of, of space business is uh, international, so uh, governments also need to work together yeah. uh, for those regulations. We need regulations mm -hmm. because we need to move forward, but they need to, to be also com consistent. Otherwise, it's uh, super difficult for us to, to create <coughs> product and be uh, 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 to comply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think almost everything was said. Uh, definitely, we need to be supported and. So we need uh, uh, governments to help us to bring awareness. We need them to help us also to, mm -hmm. to stay competitive, as I said. Uh, it's, a, it's a journey, it's a transformation. So there will be some challenging moments and we need support in these moments. Uh, we need to reinvent somewhere, sometimes uh, our business. And so we will need support. Uh, and uh, we also uh, need to be... Uh, 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 well accompanied as an ecosystem, so everybody has to be in the same, uh, in the same dynamic for it to be impactful for, uh, for our business. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much. We are uh, two minutes over time, but um, I, I want to make the, the, uh, uh, just a, a one-minute summary. So we have seen that there is um, uh, certainly awareness uh, and also an idea about the responsibilities from, from the agency level, from the, from the industry level, from satellite operator uh, level. And we also have seen that um, it's quite a complex framework uh, uh, to efficiently address uh, you know, s uh, space sustainability across uh, the different space actors and the supply chain. So there's a lot of work to do. I, I noted down holistic. Uh, we have to engage our employers uh, in order to tackle the challenges. It's not only carbon footprint, it's much larger. Uh, we had 
uh, uh, quite a lot of questions uh, which were very similar, which I, I could not all address. So it, it, it is, we know, and is, it is everything which is a little bit at the beginning, and uh, it's actually wonderful to see that you are, at least here on the European level, that you are all united in frameworks, that the European Space Agency is going forward uh, with, with documents, with regulations. Um, not everybody knows what uh, scope one, two, three is, but maybe after that session, or if you uh, announce that more. And um, I actually, we just, um, we have a lot to do in the next decade. And I want to thank all my distinguished uh, panel members and in particular Ariane Group, which has taken the initiative to organize uh, uh, this, um, uh, 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 this forum and taken the leadership on that. I want to say that these are uh, the sustainability officers. All of you have a similar title. Um, in Europe, of the main industry and the European Space Agency, please note down their names, because uh, in, the, in the future you can address them uh, directly. And I want to thank also the audience for all the questions. And of course, we could discuss three more hours, but there is a next panel. <laughs> and uh, I thank you so much. Yeah? Thank you.